Hello. My name is Bruno Basso. I'm a University Foundation Professor at Michigan State, and I'm truly delighted to uh, deliver this speech today. I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me, and uh, uh, specifically uh, Professor Cho. Um, I was asked to describe uh, the use of technologies um, in agriculture, and um, this is pretty much what I basically do, even though my work is truly in agricultural settings and not in uh, um, cities. But in this presentation, I had um, integrated um, what are the challenges um, that um, agricultural faces with some of the technologies, also in a context of uh, um, smart cities as the theme uh, of your talk. Um, I um, would like to um, start uh, by sharing um, this general threat. It's common knowledge that we have the, this global food and water paradox that we need to feed more people with less water that we have now also in a changing climate, not just uh, warmer, but also with um, much more variable and greater um, e extreme events, you know, extended droughts, um, at the same time downpours and uh, uh, heavy rains. So agriculture um, plays a critical role. 11% uh, of the globe is dedicated to agriculture. And um, we again need to produce uh, more food in the next 50 years that we have uh, been producing for the last 10,000 years. So agriculture is always under kind of scrutiny and lens and because, for example, agriculture uses 70% of the global water. 18% um, of the cultivated land is irrigated, but uh, which equates to about 280 million hectare, uh, 200 million located in developing countries. Uh, producing 40% of the food harvest and um, particularly 57% from cereal production. And despite, you know, the, the amount of food that is produced and the critical role, again, of agriculture has in, in feeding the world, we, um, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization expects the world uh, to uh, um, be even more... Um, um, allocated to um, the agricultural land to greater uh, irrigation, more than 50 million uh, and so on. We still have to this major problem that nearly a billion people um, is under the threshold of less than a dollar a day, what we call truly hungry people. And um, in the context of the talk, 20% of this population is urban poor. So the cities to truly be a smart city we need to address this particular aspect of, uh, you know, food hunger uh, in cities in addition to the 50% farmers that they are marginal land or um, landless rural uh, people. Population is well known, um, you know, projected to increase mostly in the developing world. Um, it's projected to increase up to 11, 11 billion uh, by 2050. The, um, the, the critical aspect is that urban population plays a role because by two, uh, 2050, two thirds two -third of the world population is going to be in uh, urban areas. In the next 20 years, 95% of the world population uh, will occur in developing nations, as we uh, seen from the slide before. Um, but 80% of the food for cities come from domestic sources of rural areas right outside the cities. Um, and the poorest, uh, the smallholder farmers and the poorest household in the developing world spend the majority of their income in buying food just because of their uh, limited income. So we have these particular, um, um, you know, threats about um, the urban population increase. Um, and we need to deal um, and tackle that in smart cities. The other thing is that I wanted to give you as a general knowledge that the, the calories that we eat come from 70% from cereals. So the biggest crop is the maize followed by wheat and 16% by rice. All the others 
um, uh, have a lower production of both, uh, um, you know, edible dry matters like legumes, roots, vegetables, and so on. So this again to give you, uh, I know the majority of the audience here may not have necessarily an agricultural background. The other critical aspect of agriculture is that, yes, indeed, we have to produce more food, but at the same time, we need to stop reusing the food waste. So, believe it or not, one third of the edible parts of food produced for human consumption gets lost or wasted uh, globally. And that's um, about 1.3 billion ton per year, estimated to nearly a trillion uh, dollar. And the partitioning of the waste varies depending on the developing world versus more industrialized. The industrialized countries is post, uh, uh, you know, on the shelves. It gets, you know, the labels they have a date and they get expired. Um, in um, in the smallholder farmers, it just does not. Uh, it gets uh, spoiled. And uh, so, one way or another, we still have we're still producing. Uh, sufficient uh, amount, it's obviously not well distributed, but a third is truly unacceptable that gets wasted. So we need to significantly improve uh, this uh, this aspect of um, uh, the system. The other thing is the human impact on the land. We're certainly not uh, um, treating our land better. We lose some of the best lands to urbanization. Um, the deforestation to grow, uh, for example, in this case, palm oil, uh, their land degradation, forest fires, and so on. So um, the human um, play a critical role in, in hopefully do better as again, you know, the cities will be all reflected because these people, the, 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 the key of, the, again, agriculture is not disconnected from the cities because besides the food that the people consume in the cities, Anything that happens in low-income agricultural settings will affect cities because people will move into the cities. In fact, as you see, this is this map shows urban land and um, how it is spread out, shown in rain versus the cropland. And cropland, you see that there are really few areas that they truly just cropland. Uh, this is the Midwest, all the way to the Canadian prairies some of uh, the Indo-Gangetic Plain, the North China Plain, Russia's in Kazakhstan, Ukraine, some of the Po Valley in Italy, Spain. But you see that the concentration is higher and in many places they match. You have the same concentration of reds of urban um, as well as cropland showing that those are small patches of land, more like urban agriculture as you'll see um, in a minute. So the future of agriculture is uh, um, people think it's in the hand of sensors, right? I mean, new technologies and even journals like uh, Nature, you know, addresses this particular aspect that there is a, there's going to be a technological revolution. It's happening, of course, for the last few years. We have sensors mounted on the plant and I will introduce some of these aspects since uh, I closely work with that. And, uh, for example, we have had yield monitor data. This is a high resolution um, precise uh, information of corn uh, rotations with soybeans that is carefully measured in yield. Um, but this technology, despite the fact that agriculture is becoming much more digitized, the, uh, they still uh, basically lay at the bottom of all the digitalization. As you see, ICT obviously uh, leads the sector, but agriculture is right, right next to hunting. Um, so despite the fact of uh, um, increasing digitalization, we still have a long way to go. Just again, to give you an overview of what has happened to agriculture and how technologies um, have moved to move uh, now ourselves into more digital technologies. The breakthroughs were in the 1900s, you had introduction of mechanization. In 1950, presence of fertilizer and agrochemicals that allowed to you know, boost yields here is where the green revolution occurred in India, be able to produce and feed more people because of cultivars responsive to fertilizer. In the 90s, biotechnologies improved genetics that allowed yield increase. And in 2010, we got the data science, you know, this digital agriculture, precision agriculture. Now, 
all these pieces that you see here, robots, satellite, big data, drones, data analytic, omics, all the omic science, genomic, metabolomics, and so on, also vertical farmers and microbiomes, what's going to happen in the future? And some of you may have heard this term of digital twins. So in addition to the hardcore hardware technology, the, the future goes in the direction of investments and learning more on software. And so a digital twin is a definition I work pretty heavily on this is because I simulate system. So crop modeling is going to be even more important, any sort of machine learning algorithm and so on. So a digital twin is it's basically a virtual model of a process, a product or service. Um, and why is it important? Because by simulating, you can predict things. You can head off problems before they even occur. Downtime, preventing it, uh, developing on new opportunities and so on. So digital twin is, is really one of the key aspects, again, to promote innovation and performances. And this is an example of what we work closely in simulating very complex system of biology, physics, chemistry, climatology, genetics, uh, where yield is a result of the integration of all the, these pieces of photosynthesis, water balance, rainfall, love falling into the soil, infiltration runoff. And so it's carefully and mechanistically accounted for this interaction as again, a digital twin on the computer before any improved management is advised to, to the farm. We are um, heavily working on the, there are quite a bit of investments in the US in nano sensors, sensors mounted in the implanta, mounted on the plants. There are plants used as a sensors, you know, fluorescence as a leaf that turns into a different colors to be able to see different mechanisms. And so the environmental factors um, going to be captured better with this uh, sort of investments and things happening now, these implant sensors of different sizes, as well as in the soil, like soil microbiomes and so on. So we have this virtual farm uh, for the last few years now. Everything is based on the cloud. You got drones flying around, technology on the tractor, self-driving tractor, and uh, the virtual farm is becoming uh, again, a very good example of, of a digital twin. We have a possibility of, uh, you know, taking images from drones in 3D, be able to capture shapes and changes in growth of uh, these trees. This is an example. But the, um, the drones and the imagery is not just, uh, you know, for show. They get converted. They are integrated into an example like the Salus crop models and the stability map will be able to know areas of uh, different performances, like what you have seen in the yield maps in the beginning, characterizes of you know, different performance to be able to then have a prescription map. And this prescription map to be able to differentiate the amount of input to be truly sustainable and provide the supply um, as much as the, the plant needs to reduce um, environmental losses. So from imagery, reclassification of imagery, we now have a fully automated way of distributing prescription maps. They go into the combines and, uh, and so on. We do analysis of profitability through this digital technology and show farmers areas where they lose money and, uh, and more what, what are the areas that they constantly make profit or lose money. So we have this profit stability. How constant, you know, some areas generate dollars versus others they'll lose to potentially evaluate alternative, uh, you know, either management or uh, um, species and so on. Um, so from, from the yield maps that you saw, you have a, a probability of, I mean, the observation of the uh, profitability. This is yield stability map, but that matches, you know, the high and stable areas are actually the one producing the highest profit. And so, again, this is very much appreciated by the farmers because now they know um, specifically which area to invest, you know, more inputs and which areas to basically reduce the amount of input. So, uh, the private sectors like this, in particular, this, this uh, company, Sibo Technologies, that I had, you know, the privilege to co-found with uh, Venture Capital flagship from uh, 
uh, Boston, and uh, it allows us to do a selective, uh, you know, assessment of the best fields throughout all the continental U.S. producing a uh, different level of knowledge uh, in terms of yield increase or environmental impact or risk of uh, identifying areas of different performances. So the risk is important, again, because of uh, uh, knowing um, uh, areas over um, uh, underestimation and overestimation of inputs that will lead to a more sustainable uh, management. Um, we have the possibility of quantifying for every single field, whether it's uh, you know in the rural areas or right outside a city, what is the sustainability of how much greenhouse gas emissions is emitted or nitrate leaching is lost. Um, and so this is a critical uh, thing. Vertical farming is one of the things that has pretty much revolutionized some of the urban settings in, in way of producing food. It has a lot of advantages, you know, locally grown, you can grow continuously with space optimization, continuous production, and it's a circular system. So basically there is no loss of the pest, there is no use of pesticides because it's all confined. You know, fertilizer is produced, you know, is given um, precisely to the plant as much as needed. And so that's what a circular system. The problem is that these advantages are significant. There is a high carbon footprint. Just to give you an idea is that three day of production in a ver of a vertical farm emits as much as an average passenger's car in the US for three days of production of lettuce. So 5,000 kilograms of CO2 per year. Um, and there are about eight kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of lettuce produced. Um, in terms of cost, even though, you know, this uh, um, vertical farms are not used to produce bread, but if we were to use, for example, convert and start producing all kinds of food, you know, wheat, um, $11 per loaf of bread to cover just the lightning cost. Um, and so that's obviously outrageous. Um, in terms of generating electricity, it could be done through solar panel, but the amount of energy to replace the free energy from the sunshine is um, you uh, need 5.4 acres of solar panels with all the investment uh, that require to produce the amount of energy that comes freely from the sunlight. And um, the, a very important uh, uh, innovation in uh, both whether it's to, to design Tra traceability, food safety, you may have obviously uh, heard about it, worked with it, is blockchain. So it's shown to be a technology that can re-engineer many existing crops. So transaction for farmers, tracing food, tracking customers, and the way it works, basically, you know, the users request a transaction, if that's a block, a block representing this transaction is created, the block is broadcast, um, so it's more distributed. It's like an equivalent of using a Google Doc. It's not sent, but people can work at the same time. All nodes um, find, uh, become they validated in the block and the transactions, and then block is headed to the chain, and then the final, uh, you know, the whole process and transaction gets verified and executed. So this is very important and will play a critical role in uh, food food safety, food traceability transactions. I have also been working more recently in producing in, in urban context, uh, indoor fresh produce, but this is with natural sunlight, even though it's under a tunnel. So we're simulating system, we use remotely sensed imagery, both from photographs as well as from drones um, uh, that would detect uh, rate of change and growth and be able to optimize the time of harvest and the quality of the fresh produce that gets distributed for future planning and as well as research inside different companies. So with that, I have, um, I would like to stop, I probably use more of my time. I'd like to thank you for uh, your attention. And um, again, agriculture is, is uh, one of, it's basically the greatest invention of the human um, ever made because allowed the civilization to uh, be able to become stable and create civilization. Um, cities play a critical role, but without agriculture, they wouldn't thrive. And so be able to invest in technologies that could produce food sustainably, like urban agriculture, not necessarily the vertical farming, but be able to create markets and be able to sell 
um, you know, quality produce um, as markets in the city with the use of this technology that I've introduced. It's certainly a uh, uh, very auspicable and uh, with that, I want to leave with this note of optimism that technology will probably um, help us uh, get our cities and the food even smarter. And with that, I thank you very much um, indeed for your attention.